This is Malik Cook from the University of Colorado, and the topic today is laser peripheral iridotomy tips and tricks. The topics we're going to cover today include which lens we should use for LPI, what are the differences between argon and YAG LPI, technique and laser settings, and pearls for practice. When it comes to which lens to use, we have a couple of different options. The Abram lens, 66 diopter button, it's a bigger button and it's easier to focus. The WISE lens, on the other hand, is 103 diopters, concentrates power more, but it's more difficult to use. Why even use a lens for LPI? Some people actually choose not to use a lens and simply do the LPI while lifting the superior eyelid with their thumb. We use a lens because we believe it concentrates the energy onto the iris. It acts as a heat sink, decreasing the rate of corneal burns. It acts as a speculum, keeping the lids open. It helps to control and minimize extraocular movements. It provides for magnification, and it allows you to more easily tamponade bleeding if needed by pressing the lens against the cornea. Some of the indications for LPI include pupillary block with angle closure, pupillary block with narrow or occludable angles, chronic angle closure glaucoma, and some of the other diagnoses that you see listed here. We have a couple of different lasers that we can use, ND-YAG, which is photodisruptive, and argon or diode, which is photocoagulative. The argon name is a little bit dated at this point, um, so we'll just say argon diode, or sometimes we'll say thermal or photocoagulative during this talk. You can also use combination of both photocoagulative as well as disruptive, and I'll go over some scenarios where that might help. The pros for using ND-YAG include ability to use it for almost all LPIs, lower overall energy use, and stable LPI size. Once you do it, it doesn't tend to change in size. On the con side, it's difficult in thick brown irides. You typically have to use a lot of spots, and it's more likely to bleed because you're not photocoagulating the tissue. Argon or diode lasers, on the pro side, they can be used, again, for almost all LPIs, any type of LPI. On the con side, more energy used, higher rate of LPI reclosure and enlargement. The size of the opening tends not to be stable over time compared to the stability post YAG. And you may not see it working in arides with minimal or no pigment because of the need for pigment to absorb the wavelength of the argon slash diode, as you see here. Pre-treatment for both lasers, pilocarpine 2%, Q5 minutes times 2 to ensure that the pupil is not moving prior to laser. For pressure control, you can use alpha agonist beta blockers or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. For topical anesthetics, we typically use proparacaine. You can also use tetracaine. What's the technique for argon laser or argon diode laser? Aiming beam is brought into focus onto the iris crypt. You can choose 11 or 1 o'clock to minimize bubble obstruction. Once you do the laser, sometimes you get bubble formation, and it's good if it has room to go to 12 o'clock and not obstruct your 11 or 1 o'clock area. Fire consecutive shots in the same spot until pigment is seen moving forward, and the lens capsule should be visible at the end of the procedure. For lighter irides, 0.2 seconds, power of 1,000 milliwatts, spot size of 50 microns, and typically we do 10 to 30 spots in these cases. For dark brown irides, 0.02 to 0.05 seconds, 1,000 to 1,500 milliwatts, 50 micron spot size, and typically more spots, 25 to 100. With NDAG laser, the aiming beams are brought into a single point onto iris crypts and then separated slightly in order to aim deeper into the iris stroma. Choose 11 or 1 o'clock, again, to minimize the bubble formation, bubble obstruction that can occur if you do it at 12 o'clock. This way, the bubbles can migrate again to 12 o'clock and leave 11 and 1 free of bubble formation. Fire one shot, which is frequently enough, and you may choose to enlarge. The lens capsule should be visible. Be very careful not to damage the lens capsule with the laser. Once you see the lens capsule, you can stop. Technique for ND-YAG, all iris colors, energy, four to six millijoules per pulse, number of applications, one to 10. In my experience, it's typically one to two, especially if you give the pilocarpine enough time to work where you don't have the trampolining of the iris. You can also combine argon, diode, um, ND-YAG lasers. You can use this in very thick irides, dark brown irides, where you're trying to thin the stroma before doing the ND-YAG. You thin it with the argon and then do the ND-YAG. If there are vessels present, you can photocoagulate the area around the vessels, including the vessels themselves, to decrease the chance of bleeding. Argon laser is used to thin the iris to about 20% of its normal thickness, and then the ND-YAG is used to punch through the remaining iris stroma. The settings for combined argon diode and ND-YAG is similar to each one of them done individually, and these numbers that you're seeing here are exactly the same as the numbers that I presented earlier. 
Postoperative management, irrigate the eye if methyl cellulose is used. Check pressure one hour post laser and then one day to one week depending on the optic nerve status. Alpha GAN and iopidine can be applied. Prednisolone, acetate, QID times four days is typically what we do to decrease inflammation and discomfort after the laser. Avoid myotics because you can increase the risk of posterior synechia with the inflammation that can occur. Some of the complications, one of the chief complications that we talk about is some of the visual disturbances that can occur. This is one of the rare ones where this patient unfortunately experienced diplopia. You can see that the LPIs are extremely big and unfortunately also intersect with the tear meniscus on the upper lid as I'm pointing towards here. For this reason, we started doing more of a three or nine o'clock LPI to try and avoid the lid the tear meniscus, and I'll get into that a little bit here with some of these subsequent studies. But one thing I wanted to point out, this is the worst case scenario here, the intersection of the LPI exactly where the tear meniscus crosses over the LPI, and this is the normal resting place for this lid, is just asking for problems when it comes to diffraction through the area of the tear meniscus and through the hole onto the retina. These patients tend to notice for a few weeks that they're having these visual disturbances, these light arcs as they describe it. Now, one of the things that has pushed me more towards doing a temporal uh, LPI in many of my patients is the fact that there's very low chance of intersecting with the eyelid when you're doing it on the temporal side. And you also have longer ciliary processes temporally, which can block some of the light from getting through the LPI. And just anecdotally in my practice, I can tell you that patients tend to have less symptoms when I'm doing them at three or nine o'clock as opposed to doing them superiorly where the lid can get in the way. Now we do have some studies that speak to this issue. Spaeth and colleagues looked at this question of whether the positioning of the LPI can influence the symptoms that the patients have. And over 90% of the patients in this study had no issues. Visual disturbances did occur in eight out of 90 or approximately 9% of eyes with completely covered LPIs, 11 of 42 or 26% with partially covered LPIs, and seven of 40 or 17.5% with fully exposed LPIs. They concluded that visual symptoms following LPI are more likely to occur in patients who have partially or fully exposed laser iridotomies than in those in whom the iridotomy is completely covered by the lid. Srinivasan and colleagues also looked at this question with a slightly different study setup. This was prospectively done as opposed to the SPATH study that was retrospectively done, although the questionnaires in that study were prospectively done. In this case, the entire study was prospectively randomized by patient and not by eye. They performed the questionnaires at two weeks, and there's a question as to whether that was too soon. Sometimes the symptoms evolve over weeks. The conclusion from this study is that it didn't matter much where the LPI was placed as far as causing symptoms more in one location versus the other, and they recommended doing the LPI where it was easiest to access. This is in contrast to a study that was done by Vera and colleagues. This was randomized, prospective, single mass, paired, comparative clinical trials. As opposed to the previous study that I described where the randomization was by patient, in this case, they randomized right and left eyes to one of the two treatments and the patient was masked to which eye got the superior LPI versus the more temporal LPI. Main outcomes, occurrence of new onset linear dysphotopsias and other visual disturbances were also assessed using a questionnaire before and one month after intervention. Secondary outcomes included eyelid position, laser parameters, and any intraoperative complications. They found new onset linear dysphotopsias reported in 10.7% of eyes with superior LPI versus 2.4% of eyes with temporal LPI, and this was significant with a p-value of 0.002. There was more pain experienced with the temporal LPIs. Interoperative rates of hemorrhage were similar between the two groups, and they concluded that temporal placement of LPI is safe and was found to be less likely to result in linear dysphotopsias as compared to the superior placement. Other LPI complications include corneal burns, hemorrhage, which you can mitigate by pushing the lens against the cornea, again, as mentioned earlier, late closure of iridectomy, posterior synechia formation, transient IOP rise, UVIDC, you see some of the other things that are listed here, but it's important to keep all of these in mind. Sometimes we think of LPI as an innocuous procedure, but it can sometimes result in complications that are significant, and we should always keep this list in mind. One of the questions that comes up often is the use of LPI for pigment dispersion, and there have been several studies looking at this question, and not unlike most things of glaucoma, the studies disagree with each other. Scott and colleagues, 2011, 116 patients, no benefit of NDEAG LPI in these patients. Gandolfi, 10-year follow-up of 72 patients. He found reduced risk for high-risk patients, 
And then AGS studies were done in the past. And this is a report of Reistat and colleagues looking at the use of LPI in pigment dispersion. They found no concrete benefit. What do I do in my practice? I discuss with patients and provide available data. If the patient is younger, younger than 60 with active pigment shedding and cataract extraction is not on the horizon, I recommend LPI as a low risk option. My experience in these patients is that dispersion is less after the LPI, but this is anecdotal. I don't have evidence-based medicine or a publication that's peer-reviewed to report. Some tips for success that I'll close with. Use a lens for LPI for all of the reasons that I mentioned. Make sure a lens capsule is visible at the end of the procedure. You want to see some pigment coming through, hopefully, because that really tells you that you've opened the LPI sufficiently. Ensure that the pupil is immobile prior to beginning the procedure. You don't want that trampolining that can occur with the iris if the pupil isn't completely constricted. Make LPI well away from the tear meniscus under normal lid position or nasal temporal. We choose to go temporal for, again, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Consider using photocoagulating laser in patients with abnormal vasculature or prolonged bleeding due to medications that they might be taking. I also want to point you towards some educational resources, including keogt.com and then YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, where I place most of these videos. You can choose to follow on any one of these channels, and I thank you for your time.